Hello, everybody. I always love a good entrepreneurial journey, and I'm super excited to talk with Alan and Robin LaPointe, owners of the Strain Right Company's Geary Brewing and 1820 Brewing Company, about how they've not only grown so many unique brands, but also managed to do so while staying together. And today, <laughs> we're going to focus on their non-alcoholic brand, 1820. But first, let's meet our guest. Alan, Robin, tell us a little bit more about what you currently do in the world of beer. Well, currently um, in the world of beer, we own New England's first craft brewery, which is Geary Brewing Company, holds license number 13 nationally, first one east of the Mississippi, and that was granted in 1983. And we also recently just started 1820 Brewing Company, a non-alcoholic brewing company where we produce some pretty awesome non-alcoholic beers. And I'm drinking one today. I'll concur that it's quite delicious. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Alan, anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, Robin kind of hit it. I'm, uh, I'm Alan LaPointe. I am the co-owner of 1820 Brewing and Gary Brewing Company as well. And we're really excited to be here with you today, Andrew. Awesome. Well, it's going to be a great conversation. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you both got in the beer industry. Where did this start? Was it always a dream of yours? Or how did you end up owning the oldest brewery in Maine? <laughs> well, for a couple of reasons. Um, no, we didn't always dream of that exactly, but we are pretty passionate about some things. And um, Alan and I are very passionate about Maine manufacturing and everything we can do to support the state that we live in. We also have phenomenal background in business and beverages and liquids. We are pioneers in filtration. And we happen to have worked with Geary Brewing Company, DL Geary Brewing at that time. And um, they were customers and they had had a, a couple issues or questions in filtration and had us in. They already bought our products, but Alan had been down visiting. We are global, by the way. But and our the other company you run, what's that one called, Robin? The other company, the Strain Right. You're right. The Strain Right Companies. And uh, we are actually global and we're a pioneer in the filtration industry, just as Geary Brewing Company was a pioneer in craft beer, right? In 1983, nobody was doing this. Um, he was the first one. Anyway, so um, Alan had been down to help them with a question and an issue they had, and he got to know the business besides the filtration piece and what was brewing down there. And they really um, shared a lot with him and he worked with them for quite a while. And then at the end of the day, they asked us to take over the brand. So in March, um, around our beginning of our 50s, when we had a 50th birthday, birthday um, we took over Geary Brewing Company and transitioned to what we are today. Alan, what was that like? I mean, you obviously had a relationship with the brewery, but how did it go from helping them out with some things to, oh, wow, we now own this brewery? What did, went through your mind and went through that process? Yeah, you know, as Robin alluded to, I'm, uh, the one who turned 50 was me. Uh, <laughs> so who knows, who knows if that played a part in it? But uh, as Robin was saying, the Strainer Companies is a company that is founded on a science-based innovation for purifying liquids of all sorts. And we've done work within the spirits and the alcoholic, non-alcoholic beverage industry for quite a long time. So when I was working with DL and his, and his opera operations people, I really got to love the people. People were great. The brand was great. The history of the brewery was phenomenal. It's a great story on how it started and how he started the brewery. And David was getting uh, to an age where he had to make a decision in his mind of how, how is he going to transition this organization? Two great kids. They just didn't have the same level of interest in beer and brewing that he did. And when he approached me and we talked about it a little bit, I said, you know, this is a brand that has to has to persevere through the next generation. Um, we were going to, we decided to steward the brand and that's what we're doing. And, you know, at some point look to another generation and up, up, up and coming rising generation, do the same thing, but you just really have to harness the beauty and the innovation that was there. And it, it's, it's really, when you go there and visit and tour, you just get a sense of the history and the, and the, the people and the love of the brand and the product. So it's very contagious. So I, you know, I think I was drawn in by the love of the people. I think passion is absolutely contagious. And so like any entrepreneur, you have an idea and often you don't end up pursuing it or it takes quite some time. When you were approached and end up taking next steps to, you know, buying the brewery, how long was that process like from being, you know, having that initial conversation of, well, we could take this over to actually being the owners? 
Yeah, so they, as, as Robin alluded to, uh, David engaged me a little bit uh, from the business side of it about uh, a year before we consummated the deal. So we had a lot of discussions. We talked about business planning, succession planning, family planning. Um, and then that took about a, a year. And then at that point, he decided that uh, after doing that analysis, it was better to look for a third party to, to transition and keep the brain going. And that's when Robin and I sat down and talked. And in of, uh, March of 2017, we got into a management agreement. So we agreed to take over the brewery, but you can't buy a brewery unless you're a brewery. So we had to, for the next uh, seven months, apply to the TTB to make sure we have our brewer's license. <laughs> So the official time when we took over the brewery, 100% was in December of 2017. Um, so it took a while, you know, and it's it's something you definitely talk to whenever you venture into a new venture. And it's, it's something that has such meaning as a brand to a large group of people. So this isn't just our brand. This is Maine's brand. So when you're taking on that responsibility, you really got to consider all the, all the different opportunities and challenges that might exist and that you need to have the same passion and commitment to it that that the owners the previous owners had as well so th that took us a little while to talk about think about it but you know when rob and i finally decided to jump in you know we jumped in with both feet and said hey let's let's really have fun in, with this and make it maine's brand make it maine's brewery and invite people in and we do a lot of co-packing as well because we invited small breweries in to help them out because it's a good sized brewery um, so we really have opened the doors to the whole state of Maine and the whole brew community. That's fantastic. And I ha can't lie any longer. I've actually never been to the state of Maine. It's the only state on the East Coast that I've been to almost every state in the country. I need to come visit apparently right now. Absolutely. Perfect time to do it. Yeah, Not right now, like, you know, maybe in the summer or the fall, but uh, definitely brew there's a lot of great beer up here. There's a lot of great breweries. It's uh, it's a wonderful experience. Love Next it. Next up, friends in state. Love it. So right. you own Geary Brewing and just like any entrepreneur, I'm sure you're looking for the next innovation. At what point did you decide you wanted to go into non-alcoholic? Yeah. Say. So, yeah. So that was ironically, it was probably in 2000. So when we first took over the brewery in 2017, and since our background is in purification and shelf stability and food safety, we have been very familiar with non-alcoholic beers in Europe for a long time. So the companies that make the equipment for non-alcoholic for vacuum distillation, ultra filtration are, are companies that we deal with every day on our other side. So when Robin and I were talking, and this probably was closer to 2019, we said, you know, we really need to expand our offering and give people a choice, but a, a choice where it is an authentic product. It's a brewed product, not with the types of technology that we're familiar with historically. So we started down that road and then COVID hits and it kind of put everything on the back burner. Um, we said, okay, wait, we got to wait. We got to make sure we're doing things the right way with the brand that we have now and meeting the needs of the, our employees of the community and that type of thing. So then we picked it back up about, oh, I would say in 2000, early 2020, 20, late 2021, early 2022. And we got to the point where we've just perfected the way to brew, naturally brew, um, traditional, true to style products. So when we brew an IPA or an APA, we really try to make it the same way with the complex body, all just, you know, the malts, the, the fermentation time, there's no arrested fermentation. This is full fermentation process, but it, it has to be in a much more controlled environment. So that takes a little time. So once you get it, the, the, the the uniqueness is, is you got this great product, you got this great flavor, but now there's no alcohol in it. So now you have a whole nother aspect of food safety and shelf stability. And that's something fortunately for us was the easy part, although it's very complex and difficult. We've been doing this for 30 years, that part of it. So when we got the brewers got it right, and again, we have brewers that are right, over 70 years of brewing experience. They were able to dial in and do a fantastic job. And we were able with our background to say, okay, we can preserve that flavor and make it shelf stable for a very long time. So that's kind of how that innovation kind of came apart, came uh, together. And you brew it in the same facility as Gary? On all these same exact equipment. Same brewers and everything? Same yep. brewers. That's very, very cool. So when did you officially launch the brand? July this, of this year. Oh my yeah, God. July of 2022. Yeah. If, if you had to describe the time <laughs> in just a couple of words, what was that experience like? 
Yeah, it's a good question. You know, it was a lot of uncertainty, yeah. believe it or not. Um, I think the category is growing great and it's nationally a, a fantastic category to be in. It's one of the few that's in double digit growth um, for malt beverages. So it, from that side, there's great opportunity, but you're not playing in a bigger market. You're, you're shipping outside the state, not just in the state. So you've got logistical challenges. You've got, we're now online at 1820brewing.com. You can buy all your products there. We can ship them anywhere in the country, but there's logistical aspects to that that you don't have with a traditional brewery. Um, so there was, a, there was a lot. We realized we, we bit off a, a, a lot to chew and uh, we've just been slowly uh, improving the process, making it quicker and easier to do business with us, enjoyable to do business. And, and again, it's all with a purpose. Right. And I think that's the important part. That's what keeps you centered and keeps you focused on a direction is having purpose. And we're going to um, dive into that purpose angle in just a little bit. But I'd love to take a step back for a sec. The name 1820, Robin, where did that come from? It came from um, the year that Maine was incorporated as a state. So it's a Maine historical number, date and time. Yep. It's when that. we receded from the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. So, you know, I've really enjoyed the growth of NA the past few years. It's fantastic to follow the segment and there's a growing number of brands out there. What makes 1820 different? Yeah, do you want me to take that? <laughs> so I, so, yeah, so I, 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 you know, it's, it's the one thing, it's the same thing that makes Maine different from even craft beer, right? So when you're talking about craft beer or you're talking about, you, you're talking about the people and the quality and the handmade aspect of the product. You're talking about the ingredients. You know, the, the, some of the best water in the world to make beer with is right here in Maine. Um, our, our friends around the corner, Allagash, will tell you it is the perfect beer to make in a Belgian style product. It's the same product we make all of our beers with. So we're starting with the purest Maine feel type of ingredient. So you feel like you're tasting Maine when you're tasting it. It's fresh. It's true to style. Um, so that's what kind of makes it a little bit different. And the, the other thing that I think that makes it different is that our brewers have over 70 years of experience. There is nobody that's making a craft beer right now that have brewers that have made beer for that long and handcrafted it. Uh, so I think that's what makes us different. That is just really our experience, our love of the product, the ingredients that we use um, and our the passion. The investment is over the top because of Alan's background in filtration, but also the desire to put out the safest product on the market. This beer matches quality and safety with everything that Athletic Brewing does. We use the exact same technology. We have a lot of know-how, we've dialed it in, and we have spared no cost in time or money to make that happen. Awesome. It's a rare non-alcoholic brewery that has this type of ability in pasteurization combined with all these other amazing assets that we have. So when you look at the market, who is your target demographic that you want drinking the beer? You know, I know a lot of breweries, you, you can't just say everyone anymore because everybody, when you go to a tap room is putting out a cool experience. But when you look at the NA segment, some companies are targeting more the athletic type person. Some people are talking about the person who's maybe, you know, also drinking regular beer, but also having one of these to compensate and dr enjoy this as well. Like who do you envision drinking 1820? So I think that we envision or I envision, I work very closely with this piece of the business and mm -hmm. looking at who's drinking it and sharing it with people. I think it's a, it's a couple different groups of people. Actually, the more time I spend with it, I think it's the person that wants to. And I think that's part of, I mean, we have this ability, these amazing skills, both the brewing ability and the technology and filtration ability that we have, but we also have customers that we want to serve them well. Right. So, I mean, I have my craft beer drinkers that I want to serve you well by giving you another <laughs> And when you're drinking and, and a great option at that. So it's almost a seamless experience from you. So for those people who are shifting them up, either because of a temporary life experience or more of a long-term experience, or you're going to be driving safely that night and you're going to make some really great choices for you, your family, your community, right? But as I explore this market segment more and more and speak to more people and do more research and you know really experience it, I see women as a huge follower for this product. And it just, women are identifying this very quickly as a really good 
alternative to leaning into alcohol to relieve stress. Um, women can't drink as much alcohol as men can, both because of body design and weight. There's just so many factors. So I think that is a segment of the market that I identify very strongly with. And I'm hearing a lot from women on this. So I feel like that's um, a very important part of the non-alcoholic beverage industry overall, um, but certainly a piece. And I see tremendous interest. But I think that um, it's kind of your everyday drinker. I mean, as much as an athlete would enjoy this, just as they would enjoy athletics, um, you know, it's really that person who wants, you know, to have a few beers on a Wednesday night, but they're not going to perform too well at their job on Thursday morning. Um, and it doesn't matter what your lifestyle is, whether you're an athlete or you're a professional. So I think those are the parts that I most identify with when I'm working with the business and our customers and the people that I'm interacting with. And I do appreciate your attention to just the quality because drinking this right now is a very, like you said, Alan, well-made beer. It's true to style. It's super clean. It's very delicious. Great. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. We're very excited about it. Our, our brewers and some of the new things they're coming out with, they're just getting better and getting a, a broader range of really cool styles that they're, they're actually able to uh, offer. Um, so we're really excited about the future as well. Robin, is it served in the same tap room as Geary? Can people have it on tap? Um, not on tap. Yeah. Um, having it on tap and keeping it safe, that's a, a, a challenge. And we don't feel comfortable serving it yet. We have very, very high standards of what we think is a safe product and what we feel comfortable serving. But you can get all of these, all of our beers in the Geary tasting room. Well, it's definitely a nice option to have in the tasting room as, you know, tasting rooms try to have more offerings to keep people longer, just be more inclusive. I love that you offer it there. Yep. And we actually have other breweries here in the state that are bringing it in too, which is really exciting. It's like, I had your beer over the weekend and it was amazing. And uh, it, to hear that from another brewer, it's just like, hey, that's that's pretty great. That's a good compliment. Is that a market you initially envisioned, you know, other breweries offering your product? Or is that something that's kind of surprising you as you have more of these conversations with other brewers? Um, not surprising, but yet really exciting. You know, I mean, I was hearing it a little bit as we were launching of others that had a few, probably athletic or maybe one other in the in and around. It's not that common, but you know, NA got, has gotten a lot of coverage lately and everyone's taking notice. And I love it when people run into our beers out there in the world and then like, hey, you know, it's pretty exciting. No, I love that too. And I've been following the segment for quite some time now here in the U.S. the past couple of years. What are your thoughts on the current market and how it's evolving? I know we've touched on it a little bit already, but I'd love to dive a little bit deeper. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, no, I think the market. I think the market. When you look at it from a segment standpoint, um, it depends on how you want to look at. It. If you're looking at malt beverages, or if you're looking at fortified beverages in general, meaning beverages that will give you an alternative from uh, alcohol, but have a benefit for your body. So if you're in a broader category like that, that's grown at 27 percent a year, and it's going to be. It's a three billion dollar industry that's going to be, you know, in the 30 billion dollar industry. So. In this segment that we're featuring uh, for non-alcoholic beer, it, that's still a big double-digit growth. And I think people are trying to drink their way to health in some ways, right? So even if you don't drink as much um, alcohol, you're drinking your way to better health. Maybe not the optimal that you're going to eventually go to, but it's definitely an improvement. So I do see this is going to grow dramatically. Um, and I think it's going to be very similar to craft beer. You're going to have, you know, the lagers and the big uh, macro brands doing what they're doing. Uh, I think Athletics done a fantastic job growing the segment, and I, you know, personally hope they continue to have great success. I hope they continue to grow our segment uh, because then that makes people more curious and understand that you can make a high quality craft beverage at a smaller company, but have a variety of styles: a stout, a dark, a uh, Vienna lager, a wit beer, all these great ones. It's not just limited to a lager. Um, so I think it's I think it's got great legs. I think it's going to continue to grow. Um, and we're just excited to be a part of it. No, I'm excited to follow the progress. The stats are saying that younger drinkers are not drinking as much. So they're looking for alternatives. They're drinking broadly anyway, across many categories. But the fact that they're choosing, you know, they're well educated 
and they're looking for a quality of life that's balanced. And so they're making choices and combining different options. And we're seeing that affecting the craft beer industry. Awesome. Now, I want to dive into something that's very fitting for today because we are on the Internet. You know, how has the Internet played out in dif different roles between Geary and 1820? And you want to qualify that a little bit more? Tell me what yeah, you Yeah, you know, I'd love to hear about how you're using the Internet to grow 1820 versus, you know, ways that you haven't been able to for Geary. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I mean, Robert can speak to the social media side of it because obviously the social media for both brands is, is a great avenue. The challenge with alcohol products is that you can't ship them anywhere you want. Uh, it's different than wine, where wine you can, beer you can't. There are laws that restrict the shipment of beer. When you're talking about non alcoholic beer, there are very few states, I think there's six that don't allow it. So now our reach can be broader and we can appeal to a greater group of people. Um, and since we have the logistics on the backside, we get it to people very inexpensively. So they can share their experience. If you can't come to Maine, that doesn't mean you can't taste a piece of Maine, right? And I'm glad we got it to you because, you know, and my, now it's going to you know, get you excited to say, you know what, I'm going to come to Maine now, right? You got a taste of the freshness. Now you got to really come experience it in the outdoors. So humor me again for a sec. A few years ago, my wife and I had planned to come to Maine. We travel each year around our anniversary. But that one year we had an airline launch out of our airport and they had like $99 flights to Denver for the Craft Brewers Conference. So I ended up in Denver for the Craft Brewers Conference instead of Maine, which is kind of fitting, but I can't wait to be in Maine. Yeah. You, come visit. You'll love it. You'll love it. So looking at your website and just the role of the internet, you know, I'm a huge fan of looking at other industries and seeing what they're doing. That's they're unique. And the subscription model is so popular in today's world. You know, we give someone our credit card, we pay it almost forever. <laughs> I, I noticed that you have your beers on a subscription model. You know, what's your goal with that? Yeah. So that's kind of to make it automatic where people can have a different experience each month. So if they forget, we will have our brewers will pick the if you have a 12 pack subscription, they'll pick the two 12 pack, uh, two six packs that you get for that month. If you don't, if you just want to be surprised. And we're, you know, we try to rotate that so you get something different. But if you want to have it where you predict which one you're getting, you just don't have to pay. You can do that as well. Again, it, it's it's a, and I think this is the internet. it's empowering people. It's empowering you to make your own choice. Do what you want to do. It's incumbent upon us as as people that are providing the experience to provide an experience that you're going to enjoy and that you can custom build yourself. So the subscription model is really about you build your choice. You, you take control of your destiny, which I think is somewhat um, reminiscent of what we're thinking about for uh, non-alcoholic beer. You know, you decide what you want to, you know, what's socially acceptable. You're drinking a great non-alcoholic beer. And when you poured it, it had a nice head to it. No one would even know what that is. Right. So your, your social acceptance is, is there if you want it to be, but you have the power to decide if there's alcohol in there or not. Um, so that's what the, that's what the internet does. It really empowers the consumer to drive um, co companies to provide products that they want when they want them and how they want them, which is wonderful. Yeah. And Robin, so looking at the internet a little bit deeper, you know, how does the power of the internet be able to ship your beer across the country, change your marketing or influence it? Well, you know, after being in the Geary's market for five years, where we are only in the state of Maine, you're always just looking in and, you know, we have 166 breweries here in the state of Maine now, highest per capita in the nation, but well, that's small state. Breweries. <laughs> and um, they haven't exactly like kept the nationals at the state border or, you know, hesitated to bring in other great craft beer, right? And we're you know, way over 7,800 somewhere for nationally. So to be able to reach out and, you know, talk to people in California and send beer to California and send out communications to people, it's just been so exciting. And also talking to other people who really enjoy this product, the, this category or my product and having great conversations with people all around the nation about it versus really fighting hard in my own backyard, you know, um, to get Geary's out there, seen, drank, recognized, talked about. That's, you know, it's it's so refreshing to be in the non-alcoholic um, environment because it's new and everyone's excited about new. And, and the other thing I have found about the non-alcoholic drinkers is they are so thankful. 
They are so thankful to have options and variety and conversation and that people are, you know, it's kind of like out in the open and we're talking about it. And it's just really, really neat. Super refreshing. No pun intended. You know, it, it has been super refreshing just to follow the growth over the past few years because it's extremely impressive. Now, I want to dive into a little bit more just about your brand because you're so much more than beer. Alan, as you mentioned, you do everything with a purpose. And I can feel this just by looking at your website, your cans, your packaging. I want to talk about your core values because on your site, it lists these words intentional, conscience, conscious, and trailblazers. Why are each of these important to you? And how do you exemplify these values at 1820? Yeah, so the, the you know, to take a moment, to be very intentional, uh, I think it comes from our foundation. And our foundation and as a brewery, as it started, was to be very intentional about brewing uh, craft beer, true to style, English style ales, right? That's how it was started. So it was very intentional. It wasn't random. Hey, let's do this. Then let's do that. It was really, let's do, when we do it, Let's do it with great intention, love, passion, and be the best at it that anyone can be. So I think that's the core of who we are as, a, as an organization. And I think it's what every employee feels when they put out a product. And if it doesn't, if it's not true to style, let me tell you, you'll hear it from the brewers. They'll be like, no, 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 that's not right. It's off by this amount, or we should do this. Let's dump that and do another one. So, and that's the consciousness. So that leads kind of into having that conscious awareness of what it means to be True to, true to style and to be purpose driven. And so it's really, it permeates really through the whole organization. And it's, it's nice because we share it with people, but the people that are making this product live it every single day. It's just who they are. They don't know how to do it any other way other than to be very conscious that we're making the best quality product on the market. And they challenge us at times when we come out with a new style, they'll ask us, hey, what are the pasteurization requirements? Did you get that letter from that bio, uh, microbiology lab to make sure that we're doing it the right way? And so it's really good. They kind of make sure that I's are dotted, T's are crossed type of thing. So, you know, that's that's the conscious awareness that every single employee has. And then being a trailblazer, I think to me, really means be on the forefront. Listen to your clients, see what they're looking for. What are people asking for? And then create that product, but be a trailblazer when you do it. Anybody can do some of the other things. Let's do the things that people don't do well. And that will separate us out as a brand and give us that kind of trailblazing feel. So I think how, that's how we kind of blend them all. But, you know, when we identified them and really said that's, a, that's our purpose, it was really easy because it was just someone coming looking at what people do every single day and what they believe. So well, one thing that you said, Alan, that stood out to me is how your team is so passionate about your mission. How do you create the culture where everyone who works for you embodies your brand. Yeah. And I think, well, I think that's about bringing them in. So when we bring in to get a new product or build a new, new uh, style product, you bring them in. We're all a part of it. They're part of a tasting panel. They're part of the, Hey, how do we want to brew this? Giving them the thoughts. And then at times letting them create a beer, take the ownership of it. And then they work with each other. So it's, it's, it's not one person who makes any company work. It's everybody. Everybody makes their company better. So if you can engage everyone to be a part of it, and that's communication and making them feel part of it, and knowing what they're doing makes a difference. People care about the quality of the product we put out, uh, and they know that. So they, they really, really take it to heart. And, you know, they taste the beer. They, they, if it doesn't taste the way they want it to taste, you know, Everybody knows. <laughs> There's no secrets. <laughs> Another thing about the conscious piece of our um, our mission and who we are is our sustainability. We I have ready to ask. Go right. on. <laughs> um, our sustainability is top notch um, from the founding of the company all the way through to today and what we do. You know, all grain is repurposed through farmers. All electricity is wind wrecks, all bought wind wrecks. Wow. We have the finest filtration. Our water comes goes back into the Portland Water District purer than it comes to us. We have a special certification. We've reached such high heights in terms of that quality and what we do. Um, our water coming in and we support our community around Sebago Lake. It's one of the finest water sources, as Alan mentioned, in the country. It's one of 50 in the nation that are not filtered. That's very rare. And um, we and other brewers 
protect that. We really are vested. We know it's a huge piece of our beer. Um, we filter all kinds of things out and remove them properly. They go to biodigesters, composters. Obviously, we recycle and compost. I mean, the, the list is on, you know, unending um, and our efforts and our conscious about that. The other thing that we were very conscious about when we first started um, running the brewery and became Gary Brewing Company was we brought in the highest and best technology in all areas of the brewing process. And we also brought in closed fermenters, whereas Geary Brewing Company has always been, because it's English style brewery, open fermentation. So the flexibility and the type of equipment that we have, whether it's in our packaging room, the things that we can do for our size brewery, whether or it's in our brew house, is just, you can't compare it to others in our air, in our size. Um, we just have been so conscious about what we did and why we did it, how we did it, the investments that we made and the flexibility that it brings for our brewery so that we can stay alive and nimble and meeting today's needs. We still provide and steward that brand that we agreed to take care of and would move forward in today's modern craft beer industry. And that involved a lot. And we both modernization, sustainability and new products. And um, Alan is phenomenal about bringing in new products and innovation. I mean, just over the top and, and the equipment too. I mean, we walked in with all this brand new equipment that we were installing and, and that's happening every year. I mean, that's how we started, um, but it's just, we continue all the time. Thank you for sharing all that, Robin. No, Alan, she mentions your phenomenal innovation. So I want to dive deeper into that right now. You know, when you walk into the brewery, you're looking at your current offerings. When do you decide, hey, we need a new innovation? Or do you, you know, have a certain goal of innovations per year? What is that process like when you're looking to innovate? Yeah, so our, our philosophy and the philosophy at the strainer companies as well is, is to preserve the core and stimulate progress. So we always want to preserve the core of what we do, but we have to stimulate our progress as well. So I always feel innovation comes from the customer. So we call it a pull technology. We try to pull where things are going, what, where's the gap in the industry. And you only know that when you ask retailers, you ask on-premise bartenders. What do you see is missing? What would be different in that your customers would really love and they'd come and increase their buys? And then when they share with, and, and no one's short of opinions, which is wonderful. So the pipeline of, of innovation ideas is, is, is strong. Um, it's just a matter of saying, okay, we, you got 20 ideas here. We got to dial it back a little bit. We can only do one, one or two at a time. So it really comes from the consumer. That's really where it comes from, because it, it makes no sense for us to produce a product because we like it if the customer is not ready to buy it. But so if we can find out what the customer is ready to buy and what they like, then it's incumbent upon us to create, innovate and make sure it meets their taste profile. And, you know, in the idea of non out food safety and shelf stability, that's really critical. So that's how it's, we call it full technology. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, looking at, you know, you mentioned the customers and Alan and Robin, how are you also engaging with your local community in the state of Maine? I'd love to hear some examples. COVID's been a little slow um, coming off of that, but we've been very involved in the Brew Shed Alliance, which is an organization that was formed of brewers. We were in the original 12. It, it, we started that organization, not, not us, but the, the group started it. Um, probably a year before COVID. And it was to protect the brew shed um, and waterways of the state of Maine, um, especially around Sebago Lake. Um, so we're very involved with that. We've been very involved with the Maine Lobster Association. Um, our logo has a, a lobster on it for Gary. Robin, Burke. you keep beating me to all these questions. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about logos. Tell, tell me about the lobster though. I Sorry, I cut you off there. So um, we have this beautiful Maine lobster on our, it, it's our Geary Brewing logo. Um, it especially lives on our pale ale, the original pale ale, which is our flagship. And you can find that logo always on um, every bottle and every can. I mean, it's on all of them, sometimes smaller, sometimes bigger, but it is the feature logo of original pale ale. And uh, we have a very close relationship with the Maine Lobstermen Association, and we do a lot of fundraising work for them and with them, support them. Um, we also, with the Maine Historical Society, they really recognize um, you know, our place in the history of craft beer, 
lot, not long before COVID, they did a wonderful piece on the main food brand. Um, and they did a subsection of the main craft beer industry. Um, that was closer to our beginnings. But, you know, every, every month in the summer, pre-COVID, we haven't restarted it perhaps this summer, but every month we'll have a major event at the brewery that fundraises for different organizations in our community. We're involved in many, many different things. I mean, it's obvious that the community plays a huge role in the state of Maine, plays a huge role in both of your brands. Absolutely. And I love your involvement. Yep. So you mentioned the logo for Geary, the lobster, but yep. also for 1820, you have a mascot. Yes, you have we Charlie the chickadee. Yes, we do. I love it, but why? Tell me about <laughs> it. We'll tell you all about it. So Charlie the chickadee is the state bird. A chickadee is our main state bird, but they're pretty amazing. Um, and they are such a, a great um, representer, representative of our brand in that Chickadees, at the, they change the neurons in their brain. They shed neurons to adjust to the social community they are living in, right? So what a perfect analogy for those people that are assessing how much alcohol they should have in their life or not. Like, let's assess. Is this, is this serving me right now? Do I need to shake it up and include something like a non-alc beer? Do I, or a non-alk wine or a non-alk beverage, you know? And so um, the chickadee already does this. She adjusts every season at the end of her certain season, she adjusts her neurons and makes way for growth and new changes and what's working for her and her community. So that's where it comes from. Um, it, we obviously want something that really represents our state of Maine. Um, loud and proud there, but also something really fitting of like that represents what non-alcohol beverage choices can mean for all of us, right? Alcohol mm -hmm. has an impact on the brain. And, you know, I think there's, you know, that's something to think about as well, but. Indeed. Do you have a mascot costume yet for Charlie the Chickadee? That <laughs> No. So that's going to have to be an awfully big one. When I come to your event, I expect to see you in that costume, Alan. <laughs> so I always love talking to husband and wife duos about running the business and looking at all the companies you run together. You two must really like working together, right? So <laughs> looking back, what made you two first decide it was a good idea not to only be in a relationship, but also on a professional level? Well, I have to tell you that, um, so Alan and I went to college together. We met at college and um, it, not long after college, Alan took over the Strainwright companies. And I made a very conscious decision at that time. That was a second generation family business. And I felt my job was to support Alan and not be involved in the business. And um, I was always involved on the um, advisory level management team. But as Alan's personal consultant, my background is consulting and I have my MBA, but we have three children and we have a lot of businesses, even beyond the ones we're talking about here. And I felt like my job was to support Alan in that way and build our family and take care of our family. And then sort of We've done a lot of work in family business um, transition of ownership and things like that. We're very knowledgeable there. And I did a lot of consulting in that as well. So I take care of the family part and the family aspect of that business and consult to Alan at the Strain Right business when he asks for it and when he needs my help. I love that you're his personal consultant. That's right? Awesome. Only Huge when plus on my side. <laughs> Only when asked, though, you have to know, you never, you never offer, you just respond. But then in 2017, we took on Geary Brewing Company, and that was um, a totally different situation. More hands were needed. Um, I did have some background in, in the restaurant industry, in consulting, in business, in customer service, um, more on that, Alan is very heavy on the financial manufacturing technological chemistry side. Brewing is chemistry. Um, and I was very much on the marketing soft side people, um, communications. And so hence that business marriage happened. I ran Geary Brewing Company for five years as the president, transitioning that business from the old guard to this new modern business and sort of making it through the transition. 
I stepped out a little bit this last summer for a new role in the overall umbrella of the businesses and also some personal time for myself and my family that had been back both myself and my family and that other piece that I was talking about really got back burnered because this was a full court press for Geary Brewing Company and I really needed a breath. Little did I, and meanwhile, Alan's planning his new product development and we got this NA beer and all this stuff and the launch and I'm thinking, oh man, I can't launch this and do this and I'm, you know, I'm going to step back. Turns out I was all involved in the launch, but fortunately I had stepped back from that piece. And um, it's not always easy for Alan and I, you know, and honestly, our kids hate to hear about beer at dinner. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So my wife and I, you know, we work together as well. She helps me a lot with the back end of projects. You know, how do you separate your personal lives from those talks about beer at the dinner table? Do you have any boundaries that you set? Sometimes we're better than others, you know? Um, I don't know, Alan, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I think um, I think the dinner table part, we're probably 80% pretty good there. But when dinner's over and we start talking the business, they leave immediately. They want no <laughs> part of it. They're like, okay, you're going to start talking business. I'm going to do my homework. So it's very interesting. They're, you know, our youngest is 16 and we have a 22-year-old uh, that's uh, in college. But um yeah, they, they know when to exit. The, and it's usually towards the very end, if not dinner's over and we're, we're talking about things. But that, I will say, uh, being in it, you know, we've been in the family business now for over 30 years. The hardest part is that separation and not just with, you know, beer, it's with anything. So I think one of the, you know, one of the things that's most important for people that are working together is to have that safe place where you can just be the two of you or just be the four or five of you. Um, so differentiate, we were really good up until Gary's, um, that was a lot easier. We have a much bigger organization, so we have a lot of great people. So I didn't have to bring a lot of stuff home. Right. Um, and that's, but this is a little different Co consumer facing brands take a lot of energy and they take a lot of th careful thought. And so that's a little bit challenging. And so we're working, we're still working through that part of it. We're not perfect at it. That's for sure. No. And the other thing that's been interesting with, um, uh, the brewery is that, you know, Saturdays are beer festivals and the public does come to your location of business and could be weekends that, you know, um, there's so much to do for it, you know, between operating during the day for sales and distributors and making beer. And then you get to, you hardly ever get to work on your business because there's not enough hours in the day. Then you've got the public interface on social media and in your tasting room or customers that write to you that have tried your product, happy or, you know, have a concern. And it's just like, there's a lot to it. And um, Alan's running one business, I was running another business. He's obviously busy during the day, I'm busy during the day. Kind of makes sense that the only time we see each other, we talk about some of these things. Um, I also feel like a little bit, I, I am very conscious about it and I try not to over inundate and honor my kids when they say that. But I also think it's kind of cool that they get a little business entrepreneurial experience at the dinner table or in the living room, right? I had to go get my MBA for that. And um, my father was in education. You know, my mother was a librarian. So I don't think it's bad for them to hear a bit of it, but it can be overwhelming as well. It's a good spirit to have. Do you see your kids wanting to get involved in the business or businesses someday? Um, our oldest son is 25 and he is our first member of the third generation at the Strainwright companies. And so he is involved. He uh, is in the Northeast sales and international sales for us. And um, that's great. Um, a little earlier than we planned. We did have this rule that none of the children could enter the business for five years, but he was a graduate of that first class of COVID and um he he ended up sneaking in and um <laughs> and our second son he also he does not drink alcohol and um he has had a podcast company it was called Cath college athletes talking college sports cool. and he started this business during covid and um so it, it's been fun he and i work a bit together um sort of on internship type projects but that's been really fun as well and our daughter, I just love exposing her to it. I just, you know, it's just really cool. So. 
Yeah, I think learning entrepreneurial skills is something very, very important for the youth of today. You know, it's, it gives you a great mentality and outlook on life and just desire to be the best you can and find opportunities and connect with wonderful people who share those values. Yep. Yeah. You Absolutely. know, entrepreneurship gives you creativity and flexibility, options of creativity and flexibility. And our children grew up with it. They grew up with that real nice benefit of flexibility. We might work a lot, but we also have the option to like go to their baseball games or make a trip with them or expose them to something very special. Um, our kids are, our boys now have been old enough to serve at craft beer festivals for quite some time. We've taken two international trips um, where they've poured um, in internationally. So, you know, um, when you have your own business, there's a lot to it. There's a lot you're responsible for. Um, and there's a lot that you can also enjoy if you're responsibly taking care of yourself and your business. So. I agree. You know, it's been fantastic learning about your journey today. I mean, just the entrepreneurial spirit. I know we keep saying that over and over again, but what you've demonstrated over your career truly is that. So I guess looking back at the beer brand, you know, 1820 in particular, what does success look like and what do you want your legacy to be? Big That's questions good. there, I know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I think, I think for me, success, success is something um, where the brand itself would survive and thrive even with us not there, right? So that someone else could steward the product and it's got such great name recognition. It's got a great purpose that people want to be a part of it, that people want to join the join in on what we're trying to accomplish. So you don't ever want a company to rely on any one person, nor does ours. So, you know, Robin's very humble in saying she supports me. The reality is we've got a lot of people supporting the, all the operations, right? So it's kind of, she, she's just as involved with a lot of the decisions and balancing ideas and talking about it, right? Because one person can't do it. So the future would really look like, hey, this is so exciting that there are people that want to take it over and at some point, another generation or a new, new organization that wants it, but wants to maintain the same purpose and the same function because there's such a great future to it. The pipeline's strong, the brain recognition's strong. Um, that's how it would look for me. And that it would do just as well if I, we were here or we weren't here, that someone else could step in and all the, the procedures and all the purpose and all the, the things you need to succeed are, are there and established. So that's what it would look like to me. A lot like what you've done for Geary. We think so. I mean, that's how, that's how we, I always say, you know, if I wasn't here for a month, it needs to be okay. It needs to run no differently than if I was here and if Robin was here. So you try to bring the support staff and that's, you asked a great question before is how do you get people believing in your, your, um, the consciousness and your intentions, you bring them into it. You make them a part of it. You make them feel a part of it, that they have a say and they have a, 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 an indication of where we're going. And if that meets their purpose in life and their goals, and they can associate with that, you're going to have a great, you're going to have a great organization. No, that was a great response, Helen. Robin, how about you? So I think, um, remember I said I'm always on the softer side of things. So for me, I think part of success for me would look like people re being part of that conversation, that social consciousness where we look at alcohol a little bit and alcohol use a little bit differently in our society here and that we feel really comfortable. Everybody's welcomed. Everyone's comfortable making their choices, including non-alcoholic beers, whether we're out socially at a party, at a tasting room, at a restaurant that, you know, it's, we've just, helped make a positive change in society to help people have options and the confidence that their choices for themselves are the right choices and that we can respect those um, across the board culturally. So a little social change. I mean, that would that's exciting success for me um, in addition to delivering great products that people enjoy, but also that, you know, we've helped people move along that process. Well, Robin and Alan, I'm so excited to see the difference that you make. I love the positive values that you stand for, and I'm excited to find follow, follow this journey for success. So it's been a pleasure talking to you both today. And for Alan and Robin, you know, for someone looking to either try your product or simply get a hold of you to ask a question, you know, how can they do so? So you can go right on 1820brewing.com. Uh, you can email us or, you know, you can also uh, get us on social media. 
and reach out. Tell us, tell us what you're thinking. Tell us what you think about the product. Tell us where you think uh, some new things would be that you would enjoy. Um, and just be part of part of change, part of, be part of Charlie's group because we're really excited to have as many people experience this, this way of life uh, that we can help provide. Charlie's group, I like it. Yep, yep. You can email us directly. Um, you know, if you have comments, feedback, brands you'd like to see, styles. Um, we always love to hear positive feedback out on social media. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from people. Awesome. Alan and Robin, it's so, so great to dive into your story today. I'm excited to drink some more of these delicious beers and hopefully join you in person at some point in Maine. So thanks again for today. We'll see you soon. Absolutely. Come up and see you. It's great, great having you. Great talking with you, Andrew. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.